I've been hesitating to make this video like a lot, <laughs> but here I am. I'm going to do it and God's going to get the glory. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Amanda Pittman and I talk about faith, confidence, and lifestyle from a Christian woman's perspective. Today, I'm going to be sharing my testimony with you of deliverance. And I do mean literal spiritual deliverance, which is going to go there. Now, I do want to be clear that this video is not about a theological stance on deliverance. That can be for another video. That can be for another comment section. All I'm going to do is share my testimony, take it or leave it, because this is what has happened to me. And I'm not going to fabricate what God has done in my life. And I'm also not going to try to theologically defend what the Lord has done in my life. At this point in my walk with God, I'm just at a point where if you believe me, you believe me. If you don't, you don't. I've just seen too much at this point. Physically experienced him too much. I've had too many dreams. I've seen too many things come to pass. And while it is somewhat challenging to put myself out there and share with you these spiritual experiences that I've had, I know that they're going to breed faith in someone else. And I just want that for more people. Throughout my life, I wasn't entirely sure about deliverance. I wouldn't say that I was very pro-deliverance or very anti-deliverance. I think it was very much gray area for me. I didn't have a strong leaning one way or the other. And I think one of the reasons was, was because I did understand that there's a spiritual realm that exists. And I also see the life of Jesus and I see the life of the apostles. And when you look at them, part of their ministry was casting out demons. And so I don't want to be so small-minded and put God in a box to think God can't do that. I'm so glad I brought water, y'all. I've been so dry lately. <laughs> this is a blessing. Even though I hadn't studied it biblically yet, I was still open. If someone could show me, if someone could explain it to me, I'd be receptive. At the end of the day, I just want the truth. <laughs> and this leads to my fears about deliverance. I did have quite a bit of fears around deliverance, not because I, I'm afraid of a demon coming out of me, not because I'm afraid of the spiritual realm. I, I do believe I have authority. I think my fear came from a place of like really fearing people, not fearing demons. I was afraid that if I walked into an environment and someone's expecting to deliver me, what they're going to do is that they're going to label me in the natural. They're going to look at me with their natural eye and then they're going to just place these labels on me. Oh, you look like because you wear a lot of makeup, you have a spirit of seduction, you know, or, you know, because you're really confident, you have a spirit of arrogance or pride, you know, and, and, and that's the last thing I wanted um, because I have been in environments before where people have labeled me a spirit that I do not have, literally called a Jezebel. And for those people to come back around and say, I'm so sorry that that happened. That's not the case. It was a time for me where I was learning so much about deliverance. I was calling everything a spirit. And even with the people that I bring up, like we've since reconciled, it's not like I'm holding grudges against anyone, but because those were my experiences with that it really hurt me. It hurt me deeply. Um, and so I was afraid of going through deliverance for the sake of other people to make them feel like I was legitimized because I had gone through deliverance and also to like prove that I'm a clean vessel, to prove that I'm good enough. And there was just a lot of pain there, if I'm being honest. There was a lot of pain there. And, um, ooh. And there was even a season in my life where I actively sought out a deliverance minister and um, met her on Zoom and she had a bit of an off-putting personality if I'm being completely honest. I told her about something that a family member was involved in, but I don't have control over this person, but she spent literally 45 minutes talking about why this person shouldn't be involved in X, Y, Z. And I actually agreed with her but I was completely checking out and really discouraged because she was rambling about this for 45 minutes. I've already set aside time in my day. I've blocked out time to say, hey, like I'm open to learning about this. I'm open to growing in this area. And all you are doing is harping on something that I literally have no control over. As the years progressed, I just kind of landed on the idea that, hey, if deliverance is something that's legitimate, which I, I assumed was, and that I just didn't have a lot of information around it, if this is something that's legitimate and I have the authority of God within me because of the Holy Spirit, then I can 
experience self-deliverance. Mind you, I had already sought out deliverance with people and they really let me down. And so I didn't want to keep putting my heart out there and also leaving my spirit vulnerable to just anybody because I'm just really craving some experience to make sure that I'm free. I thought to myself, hey, I can find freedom in Christ. And this is not from a place of pride, but it's from a place of protection because I had been hurt so much by the idea of being labeled spiritually and then seeking it out and it backfiring that I, I just didn't want to be spiritually irresponsible and I didn't want to be wandering because in that time of my life where I had felt labeled by people, well, I was labeled by people. I actually started to question myself, you know, because I like to think that I'm humble. I feel like if you say you're the most humble person in the world, that just like goes to show how prideful you are. So I would like to think that I'm humble and that I'm a receptive person. As long as I understand it, as long as you can explain it to me, I'm humble and I'm receptive. But I think I was so discouraged during this time because of what people were saying. So I started to question myself. I'm thinking, okay, maybe there's something that I'm not seeing. Maybe I have these patterns that I don't even recognize. I can't even see straight. And that's when when I met with this deliverance minister and it really backfired. And I remember asking other people who I knew had operated in uh, spiritual things, operated in deliverance. And I, I, I I legitimately asked them, hey, do you see a spirit on me? Like, do you, do you think I have the spirit of Jezebel? Like, what do you think? And the people who I asked straight up, they said, Amanda, no, you don't. You need to stop worrying about what everybody else is saying about you. And um, one woman, and she said, Amanda, Amanda, you're not what these people are saying about you, but that's, that's not the issue at hand. The issue is that you're bound to what they're saying about you. You're bound to their opinions of you. What you need to do is beg God, literally plead to God to break this spirit off of you, this fear of man, this idolatry of people. So I would say that was my first real breakthrough in the spirit um, when it came to being free from its, a spirit and experiencing that freedom was becoming free from the fear of man. I had idolized people's opinions so heavily that it broke me down. And I'm even going back to that time and I've since healed, but I, I just have this sensitivity because I remember what that felt like. I was so broken down that what people had said about me. Whew. I don't know who's listening, but you need to hear this. What God says about you is true. There are going to be people who come in your life who will whisper what another spirit is saying about you to try and tear you down because they see the potential on your life. Silence the voice of everyone else and cling to what God is saying about you. So I took this person's advice. I, I took her advice. And what I did is I, I pleaded, I fasted, I prayed. Um, every day I'm just, I have worship music on in the house. I cut everything out. I, I stopped listening to everyone's voice unless I knew that they're a safe person, which was really just my husband and my best friend, Avriel. That was pretty much the only people I was really allowing to speak into my life. And so I was just getting in solitude before the Lord and crying out to him and just having this contrite spirit because I knew that what she said was true. I was bound to people. It's not a good place to be in. (laughs) And it wasn't easy. It was literally an everyday thing for weeks. I can't all the way put a timeline on it. I'm not the best at like putting definite amount of time, but I would say probably after about two weeks, I really, really broke free from the fear of people, at least to some degree. There was some degree of freedom. I do think that there was still some residue, but there was just like this release where I stopped having to check up on what everybody else is saying and what everybody else is thinking. This was a a really big defining moment for me uh, because in the season of my life, I had left my church home. A lot of my friendships had fallen apart and I started to think to myself, man, maybe I'm the common denominator. Maybe it's me. And um, 
what I learned is that getting away with God and being in solitude and hearing his thoughts about me, hearing him speak over me, letting him restore me. That's where restoration was found. This, this fear of man really broke off of me when I just found intimacy with my father. And his voice was the most important voice. And I really think that the Lord needed to get alone with me. And I saw that isolation as it, it sent me a message about who I was. It sent me a message about um, my identity. It was an attack on my identity. This is new for me to be so vulnerable on YouTube. Um, I know that God has called me to this, but it's often so much easier to talk about the concepts that I've learned and deliver them than actually tell you what I've walked through. <laughs> so just know that, ooh, let me catch my breath. <sighs> so just know, just know that anybody who you see who's walking in this great authority in the spirit, this great anointing in the spirit, there's a story behind that. There's a crushing behind that. There's this, uh, this time that's spent with the Lord that birthed that out of them. And so I'm just giving you a peek behind the curtain. This is what I walked through. I don't mind crying. I'm just trying to keep it together so I can get through the video because I haven't even gotten through the thick of it. <laughs> okay, let me see what's on my notes next. Okay, so this fear of man broke off of me for the most part. I would say like 70%. I think that there is a little bit of a foothold there that can only come out by way of action and doing the thing that scares me. Here's what I mean by that. So I would say I was no longer bound to the opinions of people, but my body had still stored so much trauma from hearing so many things that people had said about me on the internet um, and people, like people who I literally knew. In 2020, I had moved to Louisiana. Um, we lived with family for a little bit, transitioning back to Texas. And so during this time, I was getting before the Lord a lot and like processing with him, but I was having a lot of panic attacks. And I was really frustrated because I thought to myself, I'm really walking with the Lord. Like I'm, I'm out here like reading my Bible, I'm praying, I'm doing like regular fasts, I'm trying. I'm really trying. And when these panic attacks come, many times I would wake up in the middle of the night with them. And so it wasn't something that was on set by a stimulus that I was encountering throughout the day. This is when I'm minding my own business in my own dreamland, you know, counting sheep and then boom, my heart is racing and I, I feel like my shoulders have pins and needles and it's just such an uncomfortable feeling. And so, um, so what I would do is I would like breathe, I would pray to God, I would read scripture, I would listen, I would put my headphones in and, and listen to scripture or even listen to worship music during the night. But honestly, it didn't work. If I'm being completely honest, it didn't work. It persisted, this like anxiety, these panic attacks. And anxiety wasn't something that I encountered a lot like throughout life, maybe depression. I had lots of depression throughout life, but not anxiety. And so this was new for me. I hadn't experienced this before, especially panic attacks that would just be waking me out of my sleep. And I think that that brought up questions about my relationship with God, because I thought to myself, man, like if perfect love casts out fear and that there's no fear in love and I'm resting in your love and I'm sa and saying scripture, I'm seeking your presence, but I'm still experiencing this. Like what, what does that say about my relationship with God? What does that say about my authority in the spirit? But I just kept pressing in. I was reading Psalm 23 every day. I'm saying the Lord is my shepherd. Even when I don't have a church home, even when I feel like I have one friend, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me to still pastures. He restores my soul. I was really clinging to that during that season. But here's what made the difference. At the end of 2020, the Lord told me to do the Restore Your Confidence Challenge with my Confident Woman community. And this was the first like outward thing I had done 
since I left my previous church home. And whenever I did leave my previous church home, it was just a bloodbath, man. Like everybody is saying this, everybody's saying that, like everybody has something to say. Accusations are being thrown everywhere. And so it was such a tumultuous time that I really felt like I had gone back into hiding. So much so to where like anytime I would post on Instagram, I would like feel such anxiety because I know people are talking about me. I know people see it. I know people are on their blogs. I know people are in their group chats talking about me and it would onset anxiety. It's one thing to wonder if people are talking about you, wonder if people are judging you. And it's another thing to know that they are. (laughs) I knew that they were. And so I I felt as if I was hiding quite a bit. I would just post maybe twice a week or so and um, try and keep it simple. And every time I did, it just brought up anxiety. I even remember um, uploading a podcast episode and um, about two hours after I uploaded it, I deleted it because there was such anxiety that was gripping me. And so whenever the Lord told me to do the Restore Your Confidence Challenge, It was a big leap of faith for me, but I felt as if by this time the Lord had really healed me so much. I mean, I was in therapy. Like I said, I was really just in my word and fasting a lot. And so I just felt as if I had heard enough encouragement and I had been built up enough to pour back out again for the first time all year, which was huge for me because I was consistently pouring out. I mean, my husband and I led an entire church before this. Like we had a whole campus. So it was really significant for me to not pour out for eight months. Now that that challenge for me was uh, really beautiful because it solidified what God had done in me because he had restored my confidence throughout this healing journey. And even though I was dealing with panic attacks, they started to dwindle. Even though I was worried about what people thought about me whenever I posted, that fear started to dwindle. And then seeing the fruit and the feedback and the positivity and the lives impacted from this challenge, I just felt so encouraged. And I felt like, hey, I might be back. I don't know if I'm back back, but like I really did something that that was really significant and it did something for my soul. So fast forward to 2021, 2021, we move into this beautiful house. The Lord says, this is your year of recompense. And I didn't know what recompense meant. So of course I Googled it. And whenever I Googled it, it said recompense means to pay back or restore what has been lost. It's to recompensate, recompense, to compensate for what has been lost. And so the Lord is saying, this is your year of recompense, Amanda, like for every panic attack, for all the tears cried, for all the pleading you did with God, for all the wrestling you did with God, this will be a year of recompense and restoration. And that's exactly what it was. And so in 2021, I just made a decision. Hey, I have already pled to God to break the fear of man off of me. And now I'm going to pair that with action. I started posting on social media a lot again. And reels had really started to take off. So I'm like, I'm going to share my voice. I'm going to share my faith and I'm going to do it through reels. But this was a big deal to me because for me to go full throttle and not wonder what people are saying and not feeling the pressure to take it down, it's, it's significant. So I challenged myself to post a reel every single day. And whenever I did that, it did cause some fear. It did cause some anxiety, but Day after day after day, more of it broke off of me, more of it broke off of me, more of it broke off of me. And I got bolder and I had more authority and I started saying stuff with my chest and I started saying, you know what? Bump what y'all think about me. Here's what God says. Here's what the Lord says. And I started to see how much it impacted me and it birthed in me this holy conviction because I thought, okay, I see why the enemy was trying to tear me down because he sees all these lives I'm about to impact. He sees all these lives that need the same message and revelation that I've walked through. (laughs) So jokes on him, like jokes on you, Playa, like jokes on you, Satan, because the very thing that you sent to crush me actually birthed the best oil. It birthed something new in me. And after this, God blew on my platform. And that's when 
um, I, I grew so much on, on Instagram and I went over 100,000 followers on Instagram. Some people may think, Amanda, why are you even bringing up the numbers? Because for me, this was significant. God said this was my year of recompense. And so for him to breathe on my social media platform and this be the thing, this be the thing that caused me so much fear, so much anxiety. I said, God, I want to shut this down. I don't even want this anymore. I don't even want to be in ministry anymore. I want to shut down Confident Woman Co. I want to shut it all down. So for him to breathe on it, for him to do that was affirmation to me. It was God's confirmation that he still wanted me here and God still had a plan for my life and he still wanted to use my voice on social media. And it also represented every single person that I was attached to. I was able to see, man, my calling is to these people. Every single number represents a person. Every single person represents a soul and a story. And I'm not going to minimize that. So what this did is it fully broke off the fear of man because I just thought to myself, what are you going to do? Y'all been talking this whole time. You still can't do nothing. You've been talking this whole time. You still can't stop the plan of God in my life. Enemies been scheming this entire time. He still can't stop the plan of God in my life. Here I am a year later, and God has his hand on me, and he never left me. He was there with me in the valley. He's here with me on the mountaintop. If I go through another valley, he's going to be with me there again because I've been there, and he was there. He was my shepherd. You can't tell me he wasn't there with me. You can't tell me he wasn't there with me. I had to learn the Lord as my shepherd. <clears throat> so this did two things. It showed me that the enemy can't stop me, and it showed me that God is for me. And if God is for me, who can be against me? Okay? And nobody can tell me anymore. God says this about you. And it's not what I heard in my quiet time. Nobody else can say, hey, I see this on you. And it's not what God has already revealed to me. Nobody can do that anymore because I learned God is my good shepherd. And I understand he is for me and not against me. And you can't tell me otherwise because he walked with me through that season. And he brought me to the mountaintop. And he was the one who expanded my ministry. He's the one who has encouraged me to even do a YouTube video weekly now. This has been God's doing. And so... If you are bound to the fear of people, first of all, you got to beg God to break it off of you. Plead to him fast until it goes. And then actually do the thing that scares you. Do the thing that will make you subject to the opinions of people and just eat it. Just take it on the chin and feel it anyways. And then you'll say, the, then you'll realize the boogeyman is not real. These people cannot take away your calling. These people cannot take away your purpose. These people cannot take God's hand off of your life. These people have no power over you except for the power that you give them. So go ahead and do that and see if it changes your life. So like I said, I did a lot of deep work. I did a lot of deep work when I was living in Atlanta in 2020 and a lot of deep work when I was living in Louisiana in 2020. A lot of deep work. Even before that, I was doing a lot of deep work. And what do I mean by that? I mean... I am opening God. I'm opening up my wounds to God. I'm showing them to him. I'm saying, search me, O Lord. If there's anything in me that you don't like, show me. I'll give it to you. Letting him prove me, letting him give me whoopings um, and also forgiving people. Hey, I, I forgive this person. I forgive that person. I forgive. I forgive. I forgive. I release. It also looks like repentance. I repent from this. I repent from that. I denounce this. I denounce that. I denounce the oaths I made. I denounce the vows that I made. I, I, denounce, I denounce every idle thought that has raised itself against the knowledge of God. That's the kind of deep work I was doing. I was doing a lot of that, doing a lot of canceling in the spirit, a lot of uh, praying over my atmosphere, a lot of anointing my home, doing a lot of just praying in tongues, doing a whole lot of that. So that I think that the expected result wasn't something that I wanted to attain externally, but I think I really wanted to know that I was good with God. I think that was legitimately the cry of my heart. I want to know, God, am I good with you? I want to know I'm good with you. And he showed me I'm good with him. Me and God, we're tight. And there's nothing like that feeling, that revelation of being a daughter that revelation of being a son, that revelation of nothing can snatch me out of the Father's hand. When you feel like God is angry at you, when you feel like you're not in favor with God because of what people have said, get alone with God. 
and he'll show you what he actually thinks about you. Throughout all of this, I believe that I encountered a lot of mental and self-deliverance. Also, it took me so much deep work to believe that I didn't have these things that other people had accused me of having, these spirits. So I go to this Christian event with my best friend, Avrielle, and when we go afterwards, we get to hang out with um, the person who leads it. We go up to her hotel room, and in her hotel room are some of her other like friends and acquaintances and all of that. And we met another woman there who's her friend. So here they are in this hotel room, and they're sharing all of these uh, experiences that they've had in different houses and Airbnbs and different locations of like they bring someone in. And they literally do a deliverance session on them. Sometimes it's multiple days and they're like, yeah, this one girl, she was a witch. Her, her, her grandma was like a high priestess or whatever. And uh, it took a lot of time. She was doing crazy stuff in the middle of the night. We were terrified, but we just like kept going and we were able to cast it out. They had so many stories and it was somewhat entertaining if I'm being honest. But for me, it was really intriguing because I'm hearing these people who are actually going from house to house. This is not being televised. This is not being marketed at all. And they're literally acting as the apostles in the New Testament. I'm seeing them operate as this New Testament church of going from town to town, place to place, and actually healing and delivering people. And I just thought to myself, I need some of this because I want to look like Jesus. I want to look like I'm the real deal and I want to be the real deal. I'm not satisfied with just being a Christian influencer. I'm not satisfied with just church on Sundays and I'm not even satisfied with preaching on stages. I still think that that's a small percentage of our Christian faith. Like what are you doing day to day? How are you walking with the people who are around you? Are you still operating in your spiritual gifts if you're not on a stage? So I was like, I need this. I need this in my life. So I got this girl's number and we stay connected on Instagram. And she said, you need to buy this deliverance manual. And here's another book that you can read. Here's how you can learn. And at this time, I was still unsure about things. Very open. I'm open. I'm ready to learn if you can explain it to me, but still unsure about certain things. Also, even though people, these people were operating in this, I still wanted to understand what it means biblically because I had heard some rhetoric from other Christians that Christians can't have a demon or Christians can't be a temple of the Holy Spirit and house any other spirit. And that sounds like a quite convincing argument, you know, sounds like a really convincing argument. So, you know, what do you have to say about that? Um, now, these aren't questions that I all brought up simply because I didn't have the relational equity or rapport yet. I did, I did recognize that there are certain things that I don't know. So here's the turning point in my story where it went from kind of a curiosity and an intrigue and uh, some things I just don't know to I'm a believer. Here's where it happened. Okay, this story is a little bit embarrassing. It's, it's embarrassing, okay? Um, but I'm going to share it in the light so nobody can use it against me because I'm openly sharing it. Um, and it was a genuine mistake, okay? So here's the story. So I, um, my husband and I at one time had, um, these CBD melatonin gummies that we bought from our gym and, uh, we want to just have something that will help us to relax and fall asleep at night. And, um, we noticed that those gummies didn't really do anything. They didn't really make us sleepy, drowsy, or even like really relax at all. And they're quite pricey. And so there were some friends of ours who are also Christian who were over our house. And um, I was explaining to them, man, like we paid all this money for these. And it's not like I'm any more relaxed or drowsy or anything. And they were like, oh, well, there's this place that we go to where we've gotten CBD gummies before and they really relax you, help you to get a really good night's sleep. Highly recommend you'll feel a difference. So we took them at their word and we're like newbies. Like we don't, we don't know about stuff like this. And those of you who do not know, CBD is like one of the things that are, that's in weed, but it's not the thing that gets you high. THC is the thing that gets you high. 
But what I didn't know is that the gummies that they recommended, which are called Delta-8, actually do get you high, even though they're CBD and not THC because of the molecular because of the molecular structure. We didn't know this. We're just taking our friend's recommendation at their word. Our intent isn't to get high. Our intent is to have something that helps to relax us because we've heard so many people share about their amazing experience with CBD. So I take a whole one of these gummies, but that's kind of, um, or did I take a half? I don't remember how much I took. So I ate the gummy, okay? And um, (laughs) y'all, I think my husband went somewhere that night. I don't know if he had worship rehearsal. He had somewhere he needed to. I think it was worship rehearsal. I don't know. I took this gummy because I'm like, oh, I'm about to have a good night's sleep. I'm so excited. Y'all, I was high as a kite. (laughs) If I'm being completely honest, I was out my mind. I was like, what? What? Like I would look at the TV and I would like take the remote and then I would like get on the side track. And like five minutes later, I have like three letters typed in and it it was just like I was just high as a kite. Okay, so that's the embarrassing part of it. So I'm like having this trippy experience. I'm all alone. My kids are asleep and um, I'm a little bit paranoid and I'm praying to God and I'm like, God, like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like I was so embarrassed that I got so high. And I remember he- hearing the Holy Spirit say, it's okay, you didn't know. It's okay, you didn't know. So I felt like I heard his grace. I still felt so ashamed, if I'm being honest. But I heard God say, you didn't know. And so, um, but I walked to the kitchen and I'm having a bunch of thoughts and just otherworldly experiences in my head while I'm in the kitchen, but I noticed something. I'm like, wow, for the past however many minutes, I've been hearing voices in my head. And each voice has like a different accent. Like there was one one woman um, voice that sounded like a Hispanic woman. Um, One sounded maybe like a British or Australian and One sounded like spunky. And so they all seemed to have like different personalities and different voices. And I got scared because I had been hearing them for a while, but I was just kind of going about it as if it was normal until I noticed it. I'm like, wait, I've been hearing voices. I've been hearing voices for a hot minute now. And I said, God, I'm like scared. I'm terrified. I'm I'm getting paranoid. High as a kite, all alone. Husband's like in worship rehearsal or something. I said, God, what is that? And I hear him say, it's the spirit of the Enneagram. Y'all don't come for me in the comments. I know I used to do the Enneagram. I don't know more. I don't know more. (laughs) There's a whole story behind that, but I heard the Holy Spirit say it clear as day. Okay. I got chills. I was terrified. I'm all alone in this big house. And so now that I know that they're in there, I got to do something, right? So I could barely even speak because I was so high. (laughs) But to the best of my ability, I said, get out in the name of Jesus. Immediately, out, out, out. I physically felt it come up and out, physically, multiple times. And I was wondering why I'm feeling it multiple times. And then I hear the Holy Spirit say, they were nine of them. Nine of them, y'all. Why? Because the Enneagram has nine types, nine Enneagrams. Nine of them, y'all. Up and out. And I was shook to my core. And so I walked myself back to my room. I was scared and I turn on the TV and to the best of my ability still took me a long time to do it because I was so high and I put on worship music until my husband got home and uh, yeah it took me two or three days to even tell my husband the experience that I had because I was still trying to wrap my mind around it and I was still very embarrassed by it. it it's also something that's really hard to explain it's something that's really hard to explain because 
I don't think my husband at that point had ever experienced any deliverance. And I hadn't at that point ever experienced any deliverance. And so this isn't a conversation we're like naturally having or it's comfortable to have, you know. So, hey, like while I was high, God delivered me from the spirit of the Enneagram. Like, how do you even bring that up, you know? But I eventually did. And um, he didn't really know how to respond. He's just like, oh. Um, and so I stopped doing the Enneagram. I didn't really tell any about I didn't really tell anybody about it until months later. And I just stopped practicing it in my private life. Um, I didn't really have words to explain what had happened to me. And um, all I knew is that I didn't want to touch that with a nine foot pole anymore. Okay. And so, yeah, like it took me a while to even publicly talk about it. Like this is my first time publicly talking about it. And the reason why it's taken me such a long time to publicly talk about it is because I was high when I got delivered. Okay. One thing I will say about being high is that you get so close to the spiritual realm. Like I felt like the veil between earth, like our physical reality and the spiritual reality was so much thinner. It felt as if I can just like cross it easily. I can go right in and out, right in and out to the spiritual realm really easily. Whereas now like we trust that it's there and there might be certain environments where you might break through to the spiritual realm or like when you're dreaming, but like you have to just trust that it's there. But like when I was high, I was like, oh no, I can go in it and out it. It was really, um, it was it was kind of scary if I'm being honest. It was quite existential <laughs> um, and somewhat transcended. I, I, I had a, a, a understanding of I, this is my body, but I am not my body. <laughs> um, and so that's why it took me so long to even talk about it, not because I don't condemn it, but because um, I knew that if I talked about it, I have to share the whole story behind why. Um, so like right before God delivered me from that, um, he had someone send me uh, some things about the origin of it. I originally clung to the Enneagram because I read a book by Ian Morgan Cron about the Enneagram. And he said that it had roots in Christianity or Catholicism or something. And he had this history about it. And so I just believed that I'm like, well, if this is the origin of it, why would I question whether it's demonic if it's Christians who came up with it? But the truth is that there's information that's been floating around and even videos that have been floating around about the origin of it. And the guy who came up with it saying that he got it from automatic writing, meaning another spirit possesses body and he's just writing without even thinking. And so when I heard that, I stopped even practicing it. But it wasn't not long after, maybe two weeks later, when I got delivered. So one thing I learned is that you have to come out of agreement with something in your mind before it comes out of your body. That's really important. You literally have to denounce, renounce, all of that because those are open doors that gives the enemy a foothold in your life to remain there you're giving him permission to be there when you do that and so i actually had to kind of renounce it in my mind i repented for it even before the deliverance took place i repented for it and um and then after i i repented for it the deliverance came after so this is how i really started believing in deliverance because i had the experience with like being free from the fear of people um, but that was just me and God. And I never actually felt a spirit come out when that happened. And then there's this other experience with the Enneagram. And I'm like, well, that's something I just can't explain. Things came out of me and I felt it. I felt it. I said, come out. And they came out, nine of them. So how do you explain that? So I started to think to myself, okay, if Christians can't have a demon, then what came out of me? <laughs> It just is what it is. So this is when I'm like, okay, there's validity to this, even if I don't fully understand it or comprehend it. Fast forward, I'm still in contact with this girl that I met at a Christian event. And um, there's a, another girl that I'm, I'm talking with, you know, as I'm talking with her and walking through things with her, it's very clear that this is spiritual in nature more than anything else. A lot of things, when I walk people through them, when I coach them, when, um, when I help people, like I often lean towards like, hey, let's figure this out in the emotional. Let's get to the root of it. Let's let God in. Let's let's replace it with truth. 
um, really digging in. Sometimes I'll share a prophetic word. And then sometimes it's strategy. Sometimes it's like, okay, you're coming to me because you need strategy. Well, I can get strategy, okay? And we'll strategize. But this was so clear to me, hey, what you're dealing with, this is this is spiritual. This is, this is, these are spirits. It's kind of like beyond me. Um, and so I was like, but I do know someone. And so this girl lives in Houston. So I'm like, hey, let's meet up in Houston. So we do. So me, my girl, and this other friend that I met um, at the event who does deliverance all meet up at an Airbnb in Houston. Night one, we do deliverance on the girl I brought. There are some positive things about that. Um, we may end up doing that again. Day two, um, that night, I was like, you know what? I, I think I could use deliverance. Um, and I said something along the lines of, actually, I can pull up the text. I can tell you what I texted her. Okay, so here, here's what I told her the night after um, the girl I brought got delivered. Um, so this is what I texted her. I said, I'm just so grateful for you and your context. Truly, Thank you for your generosity. I'm so glad we're connected. And please send your lovely friends my thanks too because she brought friends that helped with the deliverance. I'm still so eager to hear everyone's testimony. Then I said, side note, I do have an open heart and a curiosity about deliverance. I know I've done a lot of deep inner work and I've also allowed God to deliver me on my own. But because I got delivered from the spirit of the Enneagram about a year ago or so, which I had no idea was there, Part of me wonders if it's worth considering just in case there's anything else I'm unaware of. I'd love to get your perspective, but we can chat about it later. Have a good night because this is past midnight. She said, oh, Amanda, I'm so happy to help and I'm thankful you're here and I'm grateful for your heart for your friend. I'd be happy to talk with you or even pray with you. I can come back in the morning before you leave if you have time or we can do it another time. But honestly, one of the prayers that we prayed this week was that if there is something that you still needed deliverance, that God will give you that desire. So this is all God for sure. And so she was like, we could do this tomorrow morning. Um, and she was serious about it. So her and two of her friends came the next morning and I was like, okay, I'm here. I'm present. I know that I came bringing her, but I'm, I'm coming as myself as well, you know, like I don't think I'm beyond this in any way. And in fact, I want to experience a deeper level, a deeper level of freedom. So that morning I had a whole full on deliverance session. Okay. So they asked me about my whole family history on both sides. They asked me about my relationship history, my friendship histories, uh, my trip, the traumatic events in my life. And, um, I shared with them in depth. I was very raw and candid with them. Uh, what we did is we made sure I'd forgiven everyone. I forgive this person. I forgive that person. I repent for this, repent for that, renounce this, renounce that. Doing our due diligence. We started with that. Then afterwards, that's when they begin to pray for me. And that's when they start to address the spirits as well. Um, now, there are a lot of spirits that they called out, a lot of things that they're just like throwing out. But I'll tell you the ones that I knew I felt something come out and there was a release from. So the first one was shame and not necessarily in this order. Okay. But shame, shame was a big one. I carried a lot of shame. So like shame was pulled out. Also sabotage. Um, I definitely felt sabotage like manifesting on like the right side of my gut and it had to come up and out. Now, the other one, there was a really, this one was like the, took a while to get out, okay? So this was the spirit from my ex-boyfriend. And um, this relationship was very traumatizing to me, um, even though I was in the relationship for a while, but it was so traumatizing to me because of how sexual it was in nature and um, how demeaned I felt. I had, a, I had been sexually abused by this person and um, we engaged in things that I wouldn't have wanted to do, but was definitely pressured and forced to do. And even though I had healed from this adequately, there was still no pain from this left, like really healed. I really felt like I bur buried the hatchet with this. I had healed, but I had not been delivered. Those spirits were still there dormant, okay? I don't even know how dormant. They're somewhat active, okay? So they started speaking to the spirit and they're like, come out of her, come out of her. And I'm hearing his voice in my head saying, no, she's mine. No, she's mine. And they're just telling him to come out that, that he didn't have authority. 
And I start hearing him say profanities towards me, like F you, you B-I-T-C-H, you, uh, you slut. I'm hearing him like degrade me, this very degrading, demeaning spirit. And this made me like shrink. I started to feel shame. And um, they were like really getting firm with that spirit. And I started to go like this because I was so embarrassed. And at one point I literally yelled, I said, I'm embarrassed. And they said, they had to look at me and they say, Amanda, I'm talking to you right now. I'm not talking to the spirit. Amanda, I need you to be confident right now. I need you to partner with the Holy Spirit right now. Don't shrink. Don't shrink. Don't shrink. I said, okay, okay. So I could kind of tell where my flesh would rise up and when it would be a spirit. That was definitely my flesh, but it was from a place of shame. Um, I felt so ashamed of my past and that this spirit was so aggressive towards me and it was so demeaning towards me. Um, and it made me realize, you know, like in that relationship, he said a lot of things like, you know, if I can't have you, nobody will. And so those word covenants really, like, it did something spiritually. Um, and so there are just a lot of, like, degrading spirits, um, a demeaning spirit, a spirit of domination, control um, that came from him. Like, all that was attached to him and um, the sexual nature of it, um, perversion, all of that. And he just wouldn't go. Like, it took a long time, maybe 30 minutes, if I'm being honest, just that one spirit. Of course, there's a lot of different things attached to him, but it's all because of that, that one spirit. They were calling it the name of my ex-boyfriend. Um, and it was just easier to do that because that's just how you can classify it. And so I was starting to get discouraged because I felt a lifting from a lot of other things that they've called out, but I did not feel freedom from my ex-boyfriend. I, I could still hear his voice like you know, tearing me down. And, um, so we're like, they do this thing where they like walks me out of captivity where I'm like visualizing the place where I experienced the sexual abuse and they're walking me out of it. And, um, there's a point where one of the women, she just like wraps her arms around me and hugs me. And I'm just like sitting there receiving the love, receiving the comfort, but I'm still kind of discouraged because he's still there. I still sense him there. And someone prayed behind me and they said um, something along the lines of like, father, come in, like come, father, come in and advocate for your daughter, something along those lines. And then at this moment, I get this picture, this vision of the father standing so tall, taller than all of us in the room. And I didn't see any other spirit or anybody else. All I saw was the father and he's like over my sh shoulder. And I just felt this sense of protection and comfort. And then I hear him say, he's not going to stay here. He's not going to stay here. And peace just filled my body. Because I thought to myself, like, what if, what if it didn't come out? You know, the father said, he's not going to stay here. He's going to go. And then the girl who was hugging me, maybe like two minutes later, just randomly, it, nothing happened. There was nothing spectacular. She just said, he's gone. And I'll be honest, I wasn't sure. <laughs> I didn't all the way believe her. I wasn't sure. I was like, hey, you said he's gone. Let me let me determine that, okay? Because I'm the one who's hearing his voice. I just kind of like back up and I just kind of stand there. Everything's so quiet. Everything's so quiet. I can't hear his voice anymore. I can't hear his voice anymore. I can't hear his voice anymore. This is amazing. From that moment, I knew I knew he was gone. And so it just showed me like he was talking a lot of smack, trying to come up and out. And he was like really like, he was all bark, but no bite. Like there was no violent outbreak or anything. It was just father said he's about to go. And then two minutes later, he's gone. <laughs> That's deliverance, y'all. Like no demon can stand against God. No demon can stand against the name of Jesus. So after that, we sit on the couch and um, they continue to pray for me. I'm just receiving, making sure I'm breathing. And um, 
there are some other things that we called out. If I'm being completely honest, like I don't remember them all, um, but I did feel a sense of freedom and a sense of lightness. And I can tell when something would lift. Um, they also prayed for my health. They prayed for my back. Um, they prayed for my stomach. They prayed against cancer. Like there was so much they prayed for. I've lost track at this point, but my favorite part of it was towards the end um, when they were kind of addressing any shrinking that I did, like shrinking, hiding, this hiding spirit. And I didn't think that I dealt with a shrinking or a hiding spirit, but I did so much in my life. And even though I do show up as a confident woman now, I don't think that I had gotten deliverance from that spirit. And so a lot of this confidence is by way of the Holy Spirit and by the, by way of me showing up like that. But imagine how much more authority I would have if that hiding, shrinking spirit wasn't there. I wouldn't second guess myself. I wouldn't get on stage and preach somewhere and then walk off and wondering, you know, did I do all right? Because that's something that I was dealing with. It was this like fear of like after I speak and wondering if it was good enough and the enemy coming and attacking me with that. And I think it was attached to this shrinking and hiding spirit and shame as well. And so they adequately cast that out. It took a little bit of time, didn't take a lot of time. They adequately cast that out. It was released, no longer there. And there was just this joy that filled the room, this lightness that filled the room. There was like this holy laughter, not like weird, but just joy, 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 joy. It was so triumphant. It felt as if like, man, I'm really here like... I'm really here free. Like I'm really feeling a lift from this. I really feel like I can, I can go back in the world and like do more, be more, show up fully as myself without any parts of my heart blocked off. And um, then one of the women there just started prophesying over me. And she said, you're going to have friends that in this next season, they defend you. And she said, um, and if anybody tries to bring up your past against you, you're going to have no shame about your past. You're going to be able to talk about it. You can say, talk about it. That's where God brought me from. And look at where I am now. It's a testament to God. Like just prophesying and building faith, building courage in me. And it just, it really filled me up. And I felt like so much peace, so much restoration. And I felt just like such a spiritual high. And it was an experience that nobody could take away from me because I literally felt the release. Um, and after that, I was different. I was changed. You know, I didn't have these um, demonic sexual dreams anymore where my ex-boyfriend would show up and abuse me. Like that didn't happen anymore after the deliverance. It changed me. Um, even before I went to the deliverance, I would go and I would preach somewhere. But sometimes when I would get off the stage, like I said, condemnation would hit me and I would loathe and I would cry and say like, was it even good enough? You know, like, am I really... Uh, like it, it, I knew that God has called me to be a preacher, but like, am I, am I, do I really even deserve to be up here? Maybe I should be doing a, a smaller task, you know? Um, but after that deliverance, I didn't even have those thoughts anymore. I didn't have those fears anymore. Those worries didn't hit me that, that it, it just didn't hit me anymore. It was just cast out. And it made me realize that some things are spiritual. You can do a lot of the deep work. You can do a lot of counseling, a lot of therapy. You can do a lot of praying. You can ask God to search you. You can do all of that. But there's nothing like actually going to someone and have them pray over you and declare for these, these unclean spirits to come out. And it's so worth it, I believe, for every believer to do. Now, as I was going down to Houston, I listened to this message about deliverance and it talked about why deliverance is for the believer. And they had a really strong biblical basis for it. And it really solidified in my heart that I needed this. And um, while I'm not about to go into all the theology because I just don't want to, y'all do that on your own. You have your own revelation of it. What I will say is that God wants to save you. And then he wants to deliver you. Some of you have been complacent with being saved, but you're not free. It kind of reminds me of the Israelites whenever they left Egypt. There was a time where God delivered them out of Egypt, 
But then there was a time where God's working to deliver Egypt out of them. There's a slavery mentality. That's why it even says in Romans 8 that we have not been given a spirit of slavery, but a spirit of adoption to which we cry out, Abba, Father. This is because even when we're saved, we can have a proclivity and propensity to believe that we're still a slave and not a son or a daughter of God. And this slavery mentality will will keep us bound. And we'll think that, you know, we're just supposed to be commanded by God rather than actually experience the fullness and freedom of his love and his abundance and his deliverance. There's another layer of freedom. There's another level of hope and, and and expectation and anointing that you can walk in if you're not bound to all of these spirits that, Many of them weren't even your fault, but the healing is your responsibility. The deliverance is your responsibility. A lot of these things, they're from your bloodline. They're from your mom, your dad, your grandmother, grandfather, maybe the other side of the family. Like a lot of these, they aren't even your fault. Maybe even um, abuse that was done to you, like my own experience. The fact that it's in there may not be your fault, but your healing, your deliverance is your responsibility. And that freedom is available to you in Christ. Listen, Jesus in his ministry, he walked around, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he opened up blind eyes, and he cast out demons. He cast out demons. And so I just encourage you, like, if this is something that you want, if this is an, another level of freedom that you're hoping for, like, go to God about it. You don't have to get all the answers from me because I'm not about to give them to you because a lot of these things, some of them were, okay, I listened to this sermon, this helped me, or I read this book, this helped me, but the majority of it, 80% of it, experience. So I would, I would encourage you with this, go to God yourself and say, God, I would like to learn about deliverance. I would like to learn your truth. And I know you are who you say you are. You are the God of the Bible. And I don't want to go do anything that's against your word. I don't want to do something to just do it. I don't want to open up spiritual doors that I, I don't know what's going to happen if I do that. But what I do want to do is I want to make sure that I'm showing up optimally. And I'm not just functional, but I'm optimal in the spirit. So Lord, if there's validity to this, can you share it with me? And if so, can you actually connect me with people who know about deliverance, people who I can trust, people, who, it's not this show and it's not them just labeling you and um, they're just not making a spectacle of it, but this is truly led by the Holy Spirit. I do believe that if you knock, the door will be open. If you seek, you'll find. God delights in giving good gifts to his children, and if his son is asking for a piece of bread, he's not going to give him a rock, okay? In the same way that God generously gives his Holy Spirit to us, without measure, we have direct access to him, is the same way that he'll generally give you deliverance and freedom so that the Holy Spirit can occupy even more areas of your life and that the devil won't have a foothold. Yeah, that's my testimony. God is good. He's still a miracle working God. He's still a God who heals. He's still a God who delivers. He's a God who keeps his promises and he's a God who keeps his word and he's faithful and he's good and he's kind and he wants to redeem every single area of your life, okay? That's why I'm confident in Christ. That's why I'm confident in Christ, okay? Okay. Well, guys, I hope that you like this video. Please leave your comments below. I want to know if you've had an experience with deliverance, maybe questions about deliverance. I may or may not be able to answer them. Thank you for hearing me out if you made it to the end of this video. One of the things I've learned throughout life is that vulnerability is a gift, um, but it's also a gift to be heard and received and um, that vulnerability not wrongfully stewarded. So if you heard this and actually blessed you, I want to say thank you for allowing me to be vulnerable with you and um, it leave a lasting impression that actually blessed you. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you aren't subscribed already, hit the subscribe button so you can see more videos like this. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in my next video.